on November 24, 1984. A Boeing 747 crashed in the Indian Ocean. Richard Parker and six other people managed to survive the crash, stranded on an island. Richard, 30. John and Sarah, 23. Keith, 48. Stephanie, 19. George, 31. And Suzanne, 62. But what happened on that island turned to the worst nightmare no one could ever imagine. Richard Parker, the lone survivor, told his story a decade later in an interview with a journalist. I will never forget the expression on Richard's face as he told me this story, said the journalist Tom Morris in 1994. Excuse me, miss. Might I have another glass of whiskey? I asked the flight attendant. I was flying back from a job interview that didn't go too well. The job was in another country and I was pretty bummed about not getting it. Little did I know that was going to be the least of my worries. The flight started off normal enough. It was one of those big planes, you know, with the middle aisle and two sets of seats on each side. I had a window seat which I was pretty chuffed about. I remember looking out, watching the clouds and thinking about what I was going to do next, job-wise. The flight attendants were doing their rounds and everything seemed just fine. About two hours in, though, things started to feel off. The plane started shaking a bit at first. Turbulence, they called it. Happens all the time, they said. But then the shaking got worse and the pilot came on over the intercom telling us to fasten our seat belts and stay calm. His voice was steady, but you could tell he was worried about something. That's when the real panic started. People were crying, praying. Some were just frozen in fear. I tried to stay calm, telling myself it was going to be okay, but deep down I was scared out of my mind. The plane dipped suddenly like a roller coaster, and that's when I heard the screams. Not just from the passengers, but from the plane itself. It was a sound I'll never forget, metal groaning and screeching like it was alive and in pain. The next thing I knew, there was a loud crash and everything went black. I don't know how long I was out, but when I woke up, it was to the sound of waves and the feeling of sand under me. My head was pounding, and my whole body ached like I'd been thrown around in a giant's hand. It took me a moment to realize I was lying on a beach, and the wreckage of the plane and blood, guts, and people was scattered all around. I got up, dizzy and confused, trying to make sense of what had happened. That's when I saw the others. Six more people had survived the crash, just like me. There was a young couple, probably on their honeymoon, a businessman still clutching his briefcase, an old lady who looked like she was in shock, a teenage girl who wouldn't stop crying, and a guy about my age who seemed to be trying to take charge. Names didn't seem to matter much when you're stranded on a deserted island with no idea where you are, or if anyone's coming to rescue you. The first order of business was to check for injuries. Miraculously, none of us were seriously hurt. Just bruises, cuts, and the shock of the crash. We spent the rest of that day exploring the immediate area looking for anything useful from the plane wreckage. We found some food and water in the galley, a first aid kit, and some blankets. It wasn't much, but it was something. We made a shelter out of plane parts and branches, working together in a way that only people who face death together can. The island was beautiful, in a wild, untouched way. There were trees everywhere, some with fruits we didn't recognize but ate anyway because we were starving. We found a stream with fresh water and the fish in it were easy to catch. It seemed like, maybe, just maybe, we could survive here until help arrived. We tried to make a fire with the old glasses and sun method, 
because none of us had a lighter or matches. It took a while, but we finally got a small flame going. That first night, we sat around the fire, eating charred fish and trying not to think about the future. The stars were out, and the sky was like nothing I'd ever seen before, filled with millions of lights. It was beautiful and terrifying all at once. The day started to blend together. We set up routines, taking turns fishing, gathering fruits, and keeping the fire going. We talked about where we were from, our families, and what we missed the most. It was strange how quickly we became a sort of family, bound together by our shared ordeal. We made a big SOS sign on the beach, using rocks and branches. Every day we'd look out for planes or ships, but none ever came. It was like the world had forgotten about us, but we didn't give up hope. Every morning we'd wake up and start again, believing that today would be the day we'd be rescued. Two weeks passed like this. Just when we were starting to get used to our new life, everything changed. That's when they showed up, watching us from the trees. At first, we thought we were imagining things, but then we saw them clearly. People. But not like any people we'd ever seen before. They were watching us, and their intentions were clear. Seeing those figures in the trees changed everything. The first couple of nights after we spotted them, nobody really slept. We took turns keeping watch. The fire burning bright to ward off any unwelcome visitors. But they just watched, not making a move, which in a way was even more terrifying. It was the waiting, the not knowing, that got to you. A few days after we first saw them, they came into our camp. It wasn't like in the movies, where there's a big dramatic confrontation. It was quiet almost like they were ghosts moving among us. We didn't even realize they were there until it was too late. One minute, everything was normal, and the next, there was chaos. They grabbed the businessman first. He was on watch, and I guess he must have dozed off or something because they were on him before he could even shout for help. The rest of us woke up to the sound of a scuffle, but by the time we got to him, they were dragging him into the trees. We tried to chase after them, but it was dark, and they moved with such speed and silence. It was like trying to catch smoke with your bare hands. After that night, the dynamic of our group changed. Fear and paranoia set in. We fortified our camp as best we could, using whatever we found on the island and parts of the plane wreckage. We made spears from broken metal and wood, not that any of us really knew how to use them, but having something that felt like a weapon gave us a small sense of security. The days became a blur of fear, exhaustion and constant vigilance. We saw them sometimes, watching us from the edge of the forest. There were more of them than us, that much was clear. They were biding their time, and we all knew it. The question wasn't if they would come back, but when and how many of us they would take next. It was during one of those endless, tense days that we decided to try and make a break for it. The idea was to build a raft and sail off the island. It was a desperate plan, but desperation had become our constant companion. We spent days gathering materials, working in shifts so that someone was always keeping watch. But they must have known what we were up to, because that's when they struck again. This time they came at dawn, just as the sky was beginning to lighten. They were silent, efficient. They took the old lady and the teenage girl. We fought back, of course, but it was useless. Our spears and makeshift weapons were no match for their speed and ferocity. After that, there were only four of us left. The young couple, 
the guy about my age who had tried to take charge from the start, and me. The loss of the others hit us hard. We were beyond scared, beyond tired. We were defeated, or so it felt. But the human will to survive is a powerful thing. We didn't give up, even then. We finished the raft. It was a flimsy thing, made of branches, parts of the plain, and tied together with vines and strips of fabric from our clothes. We didn't have much hope that it would actually get us anywhere, but we had to try. The plan was to leave the next morning, at first light, but they had other plans for us. That night, they came for us, again. This time, it was an all-out attack. They swarmed our camp, and there was no hope of fighting them off. It was a nightmare come to life. The young couple was taken first, screaming for each other as they were dragged away. The guy, the one who had been our unofficial leader, he was next. I watched, helpless, as they took him too. Somehow, in the chaos, I managed to break free. I don't know how. Maybe it was pure adrenaline, or maybe they just didn't see me as a threat. I ran, not looking back, not even knowing where I was going. I just knew I had to get away. I hid, crouched under some bushes, my heart pounding so loud I was sure they would hear it. I stayed there for what felt like hours, long after the sounds of the attack had faded. When I finally dared to move, it was with the knowledge that I was the only one left. The realization was a weight so heavy I could barely stand under it. I made my way back to the camp, or what was left of it. The fire was out, the shelter destroyed. It was a scene of devastation, and the raft, our only hope of escape, was gone. They had taken it, destroyed it, I don't know. All I knew was that it was no longer an option. I was alone on an island with cannibals. The thought circled in my mind, a vulture over a dying animal. I had no weapons, no plan, and nowhere to run. The only thing I had was the will to survive, and even that was starting to fade. But I couldn't give up. Not yet. I spent the next day preparing as best I could. I made a new spear, not that I had any illusions about my ability to defend myself with it. I gathered food and water, hiding it in various places around the island in case I needed to run again. And I made a new plan. It was a long shot, a very long shot, but it was all I had. I was going to try and steal one of their boats. I had seen them, small canoes hidden among the trees along the beach. It was a suicide mission, probably, but I was dead anyway if I stayed on the island. At least this way I had a chance. That night, I didn't sleep. I waited, listening to the sounds of the island, the rustle of leaves, the distant crash of waves, and I waited for dawn, for my last chance at escape. As dawn crept over the horizon, painting the sky in shades of orange and pink I hadn't noticed since we crashed on this forsaken island. I knew it was now or never. My plan was simple, born out of desperation rather than any real hope. I was going to sneak into their territory, find one of their canoes, and escape. The odds were against me, but the alternative was waiting to be picked off, one terrifying night at a time. I moved through the forest with a caution I hadn't known I possessed. Every sense heightened. The fear was a living thing inside me, pushing me forward while screaming at me to turn back. I could hear the island waking up around me, birds starting their morning songs, unaware or indifferent to the horrors that lived among them. As I neared the edge of their territory, marked by totems with human bones and skulls that sent a clear message of no further in any language, I hesitated. This was it. Beyond this point, I was in their world, 
playing by their rules. I took a deep breath, trying to steady my racing heart, and stepped forward. The forest here was denser, the trees older, their thick trunks and sprawling roots like the bars of a cage. I moved as silently as I could, avoiding dry leaves and twigs, my eyes scanning the shadows for any sign of them. That's when I saw something I will never forget. The older woman was tied to a pole. My first instinct was to run over to her and help her until I noticed that her arms and legs were cut off. She was dead, a hanging torso on a pole. I resisted the urge to throw up. I swallowed and told myself I had to press on to get off this godforsaken island. I had seen their canoes hidden along the shoreline during one of our earlier, ill-fated attempts to explore the island. I headed in that direction, praying they hadn't moved them. After what felt like hours, but was likely only minutes, I reached the beach. The canoes were there, just as I remembered. There were three of them, pulled up beyond the high tide line and hidden under branches. I approached my heart in my throat, half expecting to be ambushed at any moment. But there was no one there. The beach was empty, the canoes untouched. It seemed too easy, and for a moment I doubted my own senses. Was this a trap? I shook the thought away. Paranoia was my constant companion, but I couldn't let it paralyze me now. I chose the smallest of the canoes figuring it would be easier for me to handle alone. I dragged it to the water, wincing at the scraping sound it made against the sand, loud in the morning stillness. Once it was in the water, I pushed it out until it was deep enough to climb in without tipping it over. Paddling away from the island, I didn't allow myself to look back. I focused on the rhythm of the paddle in the water, the sun rising higher in the sky, the endless expanse of ocean around me. I was free, but the relief I had expected to feel was overshadowed by grief for my companions and the terror of the past weeks. The sun was merciless, beating down on me as I paddled. I had no real plan, no direction. I just knew I needed to put as much distance between myself and the island as possible. Thirst set in quickly, my throat parched, my lips cracking. I had been so focused on escaping that I hadn't thought to bring water. It was a mistake that could cost me my life if I didn't find help soon. Hours passed, or maybe it was days. Time lost all meaning on the open sea. I was weak, dehydrated, and close to giving up hope when I saw it. A ship on the horizon. I paddled with the last of my strength, shouting for help, though my voice was little more than a hoarse whisper. They must have seen me, a lone figure in a small canoe, because the ship changed course, heading towards me. As it drew closer, I could see the crew lining the railings, watching me. I paddled until I had no strength left, then just floated waiting for them to reach me. The crew of the ship, a cargo vessel bound for a port I'd never heard of, pulled me aboard. They gave me water, food, and a place to rest. I told them my story, or as much of it as I could. They listened in silence, their faces a mix of disbelief and horror. I don't know if they truly believed me, Maybe they thought I was delirious from sun exposure and dehydration. Maybe it didn't matter. They saved my life, and for that, I was grateful beyond words. The captain radioed ahead, and by the time we reached port, there were people waiting to meet me. Authorities, journalists, a crowd of curious onlookers. I was a curiosity, a survivor of a plane crash and a tale of horror that seemed too wild to be true. They searched for the island, of course, sent out ships and planes, 
looking for any sign of the others, of the cannibals, of the nightmare we had lived. But they found nothing. It was as if the island had vanished into thin air, taking its secrets with it. I went back to my life, or at least I tried to. But how do you return to normal after something like that? The world had moved on, but I was stuck, haunted by memories, by guilt for being the only one to make it out alive. I don't know why I survived when the others didn't. I don't know why I was spared. Maybe there's no reason. Maybe it was just luck, cruel and indifferent. I've spent years trying to make sense of it, to find some meaning in the horror. But there are no answers, only questions. For more scary horror stories, please leave a like and subscribe.